Hello everyone. Welcome back to the class now. So today we are going to start. Today we are going to start with the topic and what we learned that day. First we'll go for the recap of it. So what was the topic to be learned in that particular day? So first we'll work on it. Okay. So what was the top topic we learned yesterday? So the topic was the expansion of Delhi Sultanate. If you remember, we talked about the two reasons which were there for the expansion of Delhi Sultanate. Means Delhi became a capital city or Delhi became a Sultanate which became very important. The reason were two. One was the internal frontier and another was the external frontier. Right? So when we talked about the internal frontier, what it was basically talking about? It was basically talking about strengthening right it was basically talking about strengthening all those things like from internally what to do internally we need to make uh, ourselves strong so they started uh, making like uh, fields uh, the forests were cut it and after that they made the hinderland in that so that these areas would undoubtedly provide goods and services to the people okay as they found and after that, uh, they, like they started making roads, beautiful buildings, so many things were made. The purpose was only that if any area is fully protected, if any area, area is beautiful, if any area is having all the kind of facilities, undoubtedly the people from different areas will definitely come for the business. And if they come for the business, what will happen? The area will definitely flourish, right? So the second thing was, second expansion was the external frontier. So when they found that their area is now under control, their area is very strong from the inside, now they started using their uh, garrison town, means using their soldiers to attack on the areas, outside areas and to control over them. So you just see what a great planning they had. That in, initially Delhi was... Uh, uh, getting the hinder towns and it was being controlled by it and after that we find that they started after expanding that they started expanding their areas and we know that western part eastern part and the southern part of delhi they controlled they controlled it a lot and they there was the time when it was a vast introduction of delhi sultanate but basically what happened it developed under the control of two people, especially two people. So who were those two people? The two people were Muhammad Tughlaq and Alauddin Khalzi. So we get to know about these two people only who at whose time they worked a lot for the development of this Delhi Sultanate. So here we find what Muhammad Tughlaq did. You just see by the end of Muhammad Tughlaq's reign, 150 years after somewhat humble beginnings, the armies of the Delhi Sultanate had marched across a large part of subcontinent. What does it mean by subcontinent? Subcontinent means India. India is called the subcontinent. So major part of India was under the control of Muhammad Tughlaq. But after you also know from the table that after Muhammad Tughlaq became the turn for Alauddin Khalzi. So what he did? We just find what uh, first we'll get to know what Muhammad Tughlaq was doing. So Muhammad Tughlaq, they had revealed rival armies and seized cities. Rival armies means rival means opponents. Rival armies means opponents in opposition. Rival armies they just seized and after that they seized the city, the areas they control, the whole area they started covering. They started covering the whole area. Okay, and they instead of and along with that, they started collecting each and everything, all the prosperous things. They started capturing their elephants, they started capturing their horses, slaves, and precious metals, everything they started taking from those areas. So, what happens if any person is getting this much kind of land, property, this much kind of elephants and horses and all, and the slaves also to work for them, what will happen? What will happen? Undoubtedly, the area will flourish a lot. The same applies here. This area flourished a lot and it happened. It happened that way there, that this area started flourishing. Then we find that when this area started flourishing, it was a good turn for the people. 
they really did a lot there and they really developed a lot because of all these things so finally we get to know uh, yes so finally we get to know that they developed a lot now the turn comes for what happened they started collecting taxes from the peasantry and they spent it justice in their realm means in their area they started giving justice to all the people now but how complete and effective was its control over such a vast territory undoubtedly very difficult now so control a very vast area becomes very difficult so here comes a scene this was the whole area came which came under the control of delhi sultanate so here you find delhi is there and it has expanded individually we find that how it expanded it expanded to gujarat by the year of 1299 then chittor chittor means the part of rajasthan uh, we find it uh, 1203 1303 then ranthambore 1301 then uh, we find that varnagal 12 1302 to 1303 means from here to here here to here they started expanding their areas so we find that this was a good something very good which went on they did a lot but undoubtedly it was very difficult for those people to manage right after that one basic thing this was the basic thing we find after that what we find here we basically find that these were the people who started their journey okay who started their journey and they started doing everything for one reason okay what was the main thing here undoubtedly they came to india to get prosperity to control over this such a beautiful country and to such a very prosperous country the country which was known as a golden bird so they came here but do you think that the people who were hindus here were ready to accept them do you think that if these people came here was very easy for them be as their uh, religion was not being accepted by the people as they had no religion to be to flourish here how could they say that yes it is our area it is my power to show so just what they started doing they started as they were uh, the followers of islam so they came first to india and they started making a number of mosque here they started making mosque here why as you know hindu kings were making temples to for what reason they were making temples to show their prosperity right the same way as they were the followers of islam so instead of making the temples they started making the mosque here right so what was the basic feature of the mosque we'll get to know about so if we talk about one mosque here if you just go for this figure figure 2 point figure 2 so what you find here in this figure we found that delhi okay in this delhi a kunha kohna it was a old city it was a place and here it was made by alauddin iltutmis and alauddin khalji both of them did so the minar was built by two sultans qutbuddin aibak and iltutmis what it was it was the qutb minar which i told about yesterday only that who made and who constructed and who modified it the whole we are talking about the qutb minar now we are going to talk about the masjid so the main purpose what does it mean by masjid what is a mosque actually masjid is a mosque it's the english word mosque so mosque is called a masjid in arabic literally a place where the muslim prostrates in reverence of allah okay reverence to allah means the way hindus are going to the temples to worship their god the same way muslims are going to the mosque or masjid because masjid is a arabic name so they used to go to the mosque or masjid to pray to their allah so the what is that nothing more difference this is god and this is allah that's it it is their own so here what happens they have some special features just not like that we are having temples or we are just making the temples but when we talk about these people the mosque and the masjid we find there was some kind of special feature which was very common in all the masjids and what that word was what that particular thing was that here we find that members of they were always muslims stand facing makkah 
basically what happened the door was stepping it was the something towards the west side why towards the west side every time when they were doing the prayer now you know when hindus do the prayer they always turn towards the eastern side but when the muslims uh, offer namaz or they offer prayer to their lord to allah they always turn towards the west side the reason is because they have the most prosperous uh, the most uh, religious place which is makkah which is in saudi arabia so saudi arabia is towards the east direction so always they do their prayer they offer their prayer standing towards makkah means standing towards the west direction right so here what we find this was very uh, common that uh, during the prayer muslims stand facing makkah in india this is is to the west from india where is saudi arabia it is towards the west side of india so that's why we are always talking about every time a muslim offers namaz towards the west side okay and what is it called this is known as qibla this is known as qibla over here now i'm taking you to the next part so you got to know the way hindus were having the temples to show their prosperity the same way muslims were making the mosque they were building mosque mosque for two reasons first reason was to show their prosperity means we are very rich and how much beautiful how much that the mosque is that much prosperous the particular king is the particular uh, sultan is okay second thing was as india was not introduced with islam so what they wanted they just wanted india to be the part of it so they just wanted that if i am here i am the ruler of delhi sultanate if i am the ruler of india the i am following islam the pe other people should also follow it but it was not compulsory for the people to follow okay they were just telling okay if you wish you can offer it because if we talk about indian religion we know that it is divided into four categories brahman vaishya kshatriya and shudra but that was not there the part of islam so undoubtedly a number of people became the followers of islam also so now i'm taking you to the next part here the delhi sultans built several mosques and cities you just see several mosques and cities all over the subcontinent and what these demonstrated their claims to be protectors of islam and muslims protectors of islam means these were the people who were the followers of islam and they were having a feeling that we should preserve islam we should preserve the muslim people in all the aspects now mosque also had to create a the sense of a community or believers community of a believers so what we find that means there was a different kind of feeling there there was a kind different kind of belief of the people so everybody started following it like the people they started following it right now i am going to uh, go for the next one the closer look as we talked about how did they control right how did uh, what kind of features they had what kind of things the sultan uh, delhi sultans were there like internal uh, frontier external frontier how were they dealing now the matter comes how were we managing their administration as you know that delhi sultanate was expanded from the west east and maximum most of the part of southern part but do you think it was easy for those people to manage undoubtedly no very difficult for the people to manage very bit difficult for the administrator to manage so he had to manage in such a way the king or the ruler means the sultan had to manage the things in such a way so that most of the people could understand him could follow him and everybody could be under the control of the administration administration means what the way of working of the sultan so when we talk about this we basically know that uh, what happens here that uh, rather you just see what were they doing because when we talk about administration we are undoubtedly talking about a number of people who are under the control of the ruler right so when we talk about the control over the ruler the king is uh, like if we are having a government now so we are having a number of ministers we are having a number of employees who work under it the same applies here when we talk about administration what happens 
who are the people appointed as a uh, working committee as under the working committee of the governor as a working committee of uh, the sultan okay so what happens they focused on a number of things so what were the points they focused on what were the things so what they focused on so rather generally what happens to whomever we trust to whomever we find the person is most eligible we used to select that person right but here what happened these uh, people what they started doing that rather than appointing aristocrats and landed chieftains as governor because if a very big area is there they are in need of a governor who will work for them right they are in need of a governor who will work for them so they are in need of the governor they are in need of the employees who will work for them who will look after everything so they could appoint the aristocrats means the people who are his followers they could uh, uh, make the chief tens means the officers to be the governor of them but they didn't do so right in tooth means didn't do so what he did he chose instead of using the chief tens and the aristocrats what he did he just chose his special slaves favored their special purchased for military service he had purchased a number of people because uh, what happens what are the slaves the people in the military campaign if any area is being defeated so the soldiers comes under the soldiers come under the uh, under the uh, winning committee like under the winning uh, country or on the winning area or rest of the part uh, like uh, they are the slaves called a person a slave is always treated very badly but here what happens but one thing is very very important very good about the slaves that they are very much helpful and they are very much faithful to their ruler so iltutmis when we talk about iltutmis we get to know that iltutmis was really a great ruler and what he did he appointed he had the purchased a number of slaves and who were living with him so it was the purchasing really it let me tell you it was a purchasing of the people so special slaves out of that also he found there are few slaves which are very good so he purchased those slaves he had taken and what he did he uh, those slaves were actually known as bandagan banda gan actually this is known as bandagan so in persian in persian these people are known as bandagan so when we talk about uh, these people so he appointed these people as the governor to different areas for different political offices he appointed his most uh, his most uh, important and most faithful slave so as these people were totally under the control of the ruler under the control of uh, iltutmis under the control of their sultan because they were very reliable people very trustworthy people the trustworthy people means the king could easily control them the king they were always listening to the sultan only so the sultan could easily blind faith he could have a blind faith on those people but as we know if these people were there they undoubtedly flourished they undoubtedly helped the kingdom undoubtedly helped the sultan to go ahead and ahead and ahead but there are a number of drawbacks also what is the benefit first we'll talk about the benefit so as these people are the trustworthy people they can do everything for the sultan so undoubtedly what will happen the kingdom will raise a lot right but there are also the drawbacks sometimes maybe the people are very trustworthy but these people are trustworthy only to their ruler only to their malik to their master but never to their children so till the time iltutmis was the ruler they all uh, just followed him but after iltutmis his daughter became the ruler which was razia sultan they didn't follow her means basically what happens they were not faithful to their heirs like like means their children so that was a drawback okay now you just see slaves rather than sons slaves you just see that if you appoint your son what will happen if you want to appoint your slave as governor what happens so if you remember yesterday only i told you that uh, uh, 
uh, it was the tawariks and uh, the scholars who were writing the tawariks they were giving suggestions to the kings right they were giving suggestions to the kings and what kind of suggestion they were giving they were giving the suggestion that which is very beneficial for the king right so here what we find that a kind of suggestion which was given to the sultan and what it was the sultans were advised okay a slave whom one has brought up and promoted must be looked after for it needs a whole lifetime and good luck to find a worthy and experienced slave wise men have said that a worthy and experienced slave is better than a son just imagine a comparison of a slave and the slave means servant okay a slave and the son so it is better to have an experienced slave with you instead of appointing your son as the head of it so this was the kind of suggestion which was given by these kind of people and undoubtedly it was very clear now it is the last point which i am going for today so when i talk about this point we find that uh, khaljis and tughlaqs okay they continued khaljis and tughlaqs they continued to use bandagan and also raised people of humble birth who were often their clients and to high political positions they were appointed as generals and governor means this bandagan means the slaves were appointed as generals and governors and however this also introduced an element of political instability how instability you just see which uh, i talked about the negative effects now slaves and clients were loyal to their master and patrons okay but not to their heir means heir means what they were not uh, acceptable to their servants like sorry to their sons and next generation now sultans had their own servants as a result the occasion of the accession of a new merchant uh, sorry monarch often saw conflict between the old and the new nobility no mobility means the old one is telling no my slaves are good the new one says i don't want your slaves you take your slaves with you i will work with my patrons right so the patronage patronage means the right of these humble people by the delhi sultans also shocked many elites an author of persian tawari criticized the delhi sultan for appointing the low and base born to high officers means what happens when somebody is appointing the slaves maybe some of our slaves are very qualified but if any slave is undoubtedly very much uh, honest and very much trustworthy but if the person is not qualified do you think the person uh, that particular slave is going to help it so that was also the time that they were very much criticized means one person said that you must have the slaves with you you must have the slaves with you and they are better than your son but there are also some cases that if the slave is not good if the slave is not experienced so better than that don't keep anybody so here we find next thing officials of sultan muhammad tughlaq so here just see who were the officials of muhammad tughlaq officials means the staff members so official means the governors appointed official means different department the head of the different departments so here just see muhammad tughlaq appointed Aziz Khumar a wine distiller then Feroz Hazam as a barber Manka Tabak as a cook and two gardeners Lada and Pera to high administrative post now you just see a person who is a slave do you think this person is going to work a person who is a cook a person who is a gardener a person who is a barber undoubtedly the person is very much close and very much trustworthy do you think these people are having those kind of qualifications who could work for him undoubtedly no and never so here ziauddin barni ziauddin barni a 14th a mid 14th century chronicler reported their appointment as a sign of the sultan's loss of political judgment and his incapability of to rule undoubtedly if any ruler is appointing these kind of people who are least experienced what will happen it is just called as ruin the whole rule it is not going to work right so for now i'm just ending the session and you just understand what i have taught you 
So I'm just going for the recap. We talked about the Tariqs and Tawariqs. When we, then we talk about uh, the expansion of Delhi Sultanate means um, garrison town. And we talked about uh, this, um, what was that? Uh, garrison town and hindered land. Uh, then we talked about internal frontier and external frontier. After that, we got to know about who were the people, how were these uh, like Tughlaqs and Khalzi appointed their governors. They appointed their slaves as their governors and what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks of all that. So for now, I'm just ending up the session. You just get to know that these things are very much clear to you. Okay. And uh, tomorrow and uh, day after means on Monday, we'll meet again at the same time and we'll talk about this matter. Fine. And to, uh, that day will be the end of that chapter. Fine. Thank you so much and take care.